super coach, we're ready. Are you ready for the hot seat? Can we get a clap? Woo! Hey, uh, super coach, thank you so much for doing this. Thank sure. you so much for having a vision of what this would look like because you've brought me up here two times and I didn't see what you saw. And I, I've sat in here in your class and there is a special feeling you get when you come in here with all the windows, all the light. I know you're a big natural light person. So today I was sitting when you were, you had a powerful presentation today and I was thinking about, man, this place is so cool and I get access to it. I thought like that because I'm a narcissist. It always comes back to me. What can I get out of this? So, but thank you for coming on here. So I hope you don't mind. Well, I'm going to ask you some questions tonight. And these are things that I struggle with, Coach. Mm -hmm. I want your input on how you can help me. But the way I learn, the way I get the most inspired is when I'm talking to people. They're vulnerable. They're weak. You know, you've had a lot of success. You've done a lot of things. I've seen you speak in front of 10,000 people. So <laughs> we were there, weren't we, Brittany Renee? So I want to start off with this question, this first question. Do you think you found your purpose yourself, Super Coach, or do you believe you created this version of yourself? Well, here, here's one thing a lot of people ask me all the time, and I hear this over and over and over. You have to find your why. You have to find your why. You ever heard that before? You got to find your why. You got to find your purpose. Well. I found my purpose at 15 years old, in my opinion, actually started at six years old. They tell us that a unique ability is typically found very early in life and is typically detected by somebody else other than you. I still remember to this day, uh, a little league baseball coach I had in Woodbury, my mom was divorced. My mom had me when she was 16 years old and she used to take me down to the local baseball field and um, I think part of the reason was because it was a cheap babysitting service, you know, is that, uh, is that, hey, they didn't charge any money to babysit me down there. And so I would go down to the baseball field in Woodbury, Tennessee, and literally stay for hours on hours on hours. Like get down there at 4 o'clock and stay till 11 o'clock. My mom was working a second job when she was doing that. And I still remember at six years old, a little league baseball coach saying to me, son, one of these days, you're going to be a great coach. At six years old, this woman saw that in me. So I heard that at six, I heard it at seven, I heard it at eight, I heard it at nine, and my high school baseball, my high school basketball coach used to call me professor because he used to say, man, you think like a coach, you think like a great coach. So when you hear this at six and seven and eight and 10, 15, I think I was destined to be a coach. They tell us, and I don't want to take too long on this, but one of the coolest things that, that I've ever heard Wayne Dyer say when Wayne Dyer was alive is he said that before he was born, he had a conversation with God. And God asked him what he wanted to be. And he said, I said I wanted to be the greatest self-reliant expert in the world. And God says back to him, are you sure this is what you want to become? Like you want to be known as the greatest self-reliant person in the world. And, and Dyer said, yes. And he said, well, I'm going to put, uh, you know, okay, if that's what you want to be, I'm going to put your little ass in orphanages, your whole upbringing. Your parents are going to desert you. You're going to live in an orphanage with other kids all of your primitive years of your life. You're going to learn to be reliant on nobody but yourself. Through those experiences... When other kids come to the orphanages and their parents are not there, you're gonna help them. And through this experience of not having a mom and dad growing up, you're gonna learn self-reliance. And through that, you are gonna become one of the greatest self-reliant experts in the world. And when he died at 75 years old, he was considered one of the greatest self-reliant people in the world. Isn't that interesting? I don't know if I had a conversation with God before I was born, but I do know this. I think I, I was meant to be a coach. And I think every person in this room was manufactured by the manufacturer to be something great, not something average or mediocre. I think you were manufactured for greatness. Now, whether you stepped into that yet, that's the only decision you can make. That's why we can create the, the greatness factory. So that's my thought process of how I found my purpose. 
I see people taking pictures. I appreciate if you take a picture and do a hashtag GTT level up and <laughs> also put a Coach Bird in there. So if you'd be so kind, I'd appreciate that. So I want to dig in and not just ask the easy questions that we're starting with easier stuff. It's going to get a little tougher. I hope you don't mind. And anybody out there, you be thinking of some some challenging questions. I, I feel like I'm your best friend. I feel like we're probably best friends. And I see we have so many conversations multiple times a week, if not more. We eat breakfast, we go on vacations together. But um, I know how hard it is from my experience of trying to build something that's mine. It's the GTT brand. And I know what it's like for me and how I feel when I try to put on something and maybe it doesn't go the way I want. So how do you feel? Talk about times where you've talked to people and there's four people in there. How do you yeah. feel about that? How do, I mean, you've got aspirations to talk in front of 10,000 people. How do you feel when nobody shows up? Well, I believe that it takes 10,000 hours of practice to become great. It was in my 10th year that I won a championship at Riverdale. Those were 80 hour weeks. So to me, there is no losing, there's only learning. I've done events where it was a complete flop. I did an event in Louisville, Kentucky one night that I got there, these are, uh, these are Head Start teachers. And I got there at five o'clock and they had an open bar. And I was supposed to speak at 8.30 that night. So they started drinking at five, at six, at seven, at eight. By the time I came on to speak at 8.30, they were dancing on the tables. And I was so nervous and embarrassed. And uh, my wife went with me. She wasn't my wife at the time. And I said, man, I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what I'm going to do. Everybody's drunk. And I got up there and just told a few jokes and tried to be good. But it was an awful experience. It was awful for me. It had to be awful for them because they were not in an environment. So I've had some of the biggest flops you can imagine. I've done events where nobody showed up. I remember speaking. I spoke at a... a for free, an exchange club in Jackson, Tennessee, once where the average age was 87 to 95. And I, and I, literally, I literally thought some of them were gonna die while I was speaking in the room. I mean, I, I, mean, I was like, are y'all here to eat food or here to get better? Because they just looked at me like this. And uh, so I've done all of that. It took me 18 hours once to get to Heber Springs, Arkansas to speak at an insurance event because it was a massive snowstorm and I got stuck, we slept in the car and um, they had been caged up for four days and they literally wanted to just kill each other. So everything you can imagine when it comes to this, I have, I have done, I've been disappointed. Uh, but that's to me, that's just part of becoming great at what it is you do, man. You show up for one, it's like you show up for 10,000, in my opinion. That's hard for a lot of people. It's hard for me to do. It's hard for me to get motivated. I feel more like a failure. So uh, you mentioned flops. Since you've been in, um, in, in this form of coaching from Riverdale basketball to where you are now, I haven't seen you flop yet. I haven't seen you really have any setbacks. How would you handle it if, hey, our banker's back there. He's loaning you all this money. Hey, all that money. And then the economy slows down and people start dropping out of, out of uh, the class. And, and I tell you, hey, I'm no longer a 25K member. I, now I'm a 12-5 member or I'm a 5K. How would you handle that? How would well, you play through that? Here's what I would tell you. When you deal with the kind of scale that I'm dealing with now, where I'm coaching over 1,000 people a month, when you're coaching 1,000 people, one of the biggest things I see every month is people want to quit people start and don't have the discipline to see it through. When they, meet, when they get any kind of resistance, they want to give in, they want to give up. I can't tell you how many nights I go home. I'm a very positive person, but I can't tell you how many nights I go home brokenhearted. And I go home and my wife has to listen to that. She has to see how a person that yesterday told me I may have changed their life and today they want to quit. And it's very emotionally taxing on me. And I imagine like my pastor, Brady Cooper, is, you know, pastor in a church of 7,000 people. I can't imagine the burden, the burden that, that, that he has every Sunday doing that because he taught a sermon last week on complaining about, about how it eats away at you when you complain. It's not biblical to complain. And a person walked up to him less than 30 seconds after he taught the sermon and said the music was too loud. <laughs> they complained. And so what I would tell you is I've had to condition myself for disappointment. 
I've had to condition myself that it's human nature that we are very flawed individuals. People are gonna let you down, they're gonna quit, they're gonna sue you. I've had people try to sue me. I've had, uh, um, you know, I've had people that I thought were right there with me and then the next day quit on me and say negative things about me. When you push out as much stuff as I do, it, you, you get a lot of negative from people. Uh, there's people in Murfreesboro that won't speak to me, they won't look at me. Um, you know, so it's not just because I'm a positive person, I'm in the motivation business, that it's easy. I see a lot of negative in a day. And, and more than anything, it disheartens me. So I have to every morning kind of get my mind ready for what my body is about to do. Typically, Clay Skipworth's my trainer, so he, he typically has to hear this at 5 o'clock in the morning. Um, but just like you, I get up and I get beat down. I get frustrated. There's days I want to quit. There's days it's not worth it to me. Uh, you know, some days I just want to take all the money I've made in my lifetime and put it into real estate deals and just walk away from coaching because of what I see in a day. But then there's a person that comes to me that says, you know, I read your book and I was going through divorce and it changed my whole life. Or I watch your videos every single week. Or your morning motivator you do for me, I depend on that every day. And so for every one negative, there's typically 10, 20, 30, 40 positives. Do y'all believe that? And if you can ever train your brain to focus on all that positive versus that one negative, see your brain will focus on negative. It will actually focus three times on more negative than positive. So it don't matter if we have a thousand happy people, if there's one person complaining or one person not happy, you go home and that's what your brain remembers. So my wife is a good support system for me because she helps me to remember uh, why I got into this business to begin with. I can, make money, I can make money a lot easier ways than what I do, but it's my calling. So I think when it gets tough, you gotta stick it through. You gotta see it through to its conclusion. Last, uh, late September, October, we went on a, you were in Florida for two weeks. Me and Brittany Renee came down there the last week. And uh, I mean, you were miserable down there. Miserable to be around because you were working. And I mean, he's like, well, here's what I'm gonna have to do. I'm gonna have to wake up at five o'clock now and I can get the work out of the way. Mm -hmm. So we would start to find time to hang out because I'm a needy friend. And um, hey, once you hang out, I'm here too, you know? So, but one day we were, uh, we were riding bikes. And um, we would ride to the back of the cul-de-sac and we would come back. We were talking, but Ella, Ella Grace wanted to go with us. And um, we rode down there and maybe she fell off. She was kind of struggling, but we were coming back where our house was, where we would stand, it was up on a hill and she was complaining. And you're right behind her. And I remember it like I was yesterday because at times I use this. I put you beside me. You don't even know you're right there with me. And you're like fighting through this because she was struggling. She could barely get up that hill. And you said, I'm right here with you. Keep fighting through it. And she got through that. I want to know where, where did you get that ability to fight through what your emotions tell you? Because I think most people struggle with what their emotions initially tell you. I do, hey dude, go back there and eat all those chips. Go back there and eat all that steak. Go in there and do, I mean, that's my yeah. emotions talking to me. How do you fight through what your emotions are telling you? Well, I wanna go back to something my mom taught me. My mom would not, let, would not let me miss a day of school when I was growing up. So, you know, she had me when she was 16, single mom. I watched that woman scratch and claw for everything. She operated a lot out of fear many times, but, but you would too if you were in that circumstance, right? But, but I would wake up and not feel like going to school and I'd say, you know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna go or so-and-so gets to miss and she said, uh, -uh you get dressed because every day you show up. And I hated that growing up. So I went like 12 years of school and I never missed a day of school. And there was only like two or three people that did that. And I used to argue with my mom about this, um, but that taught me something. There are days you're gonna wake up and you don't feel like going to work. There's days you don't feel like prospecting. There's days you don't feel like doing anything. But amateurs listen to their feelings. Professionals don't listen to their feelings. We went down and saw Garth Brooks perform. You know how many times he sang that song, The Dance? He probably sitting backstage going, do I really have to sing The Dance again? Because he sang it thousands of times. You think he feels like singing it every time? Do you think a professional athlete feels like performing every night? So here's what I've decided. I'm gonna be a professional, which means I'm gonna show up whether I feel like it or not. I'm not gonna let my emotions control me because my emotions are gonna lead me wrong. My emotions are gonna steer me wrong, they're feelings, right? How many of you know somebody every day that when they don't feel like doing something, they don't do it? 
Some of y'all are in sales. You know as well as I do, you need to be prospecting every day. You think anybody wakes up and says, oh, I can't wait to go prospect for two hours. But the professionals have conditioned themselves. I don't feel like working out with Clay most days. But I, you know what? I always feel better when I leave. And I lost 21 pounds in 90 days to get ready for 10X. So I know it works. But you know what I had to do every day? I had to show up, man. So my mom taught me to show up every day whether I feel like it or not. And I'll always be grateful for that. Because in today's world, I'm sure Paul Parkinson agree with this, we live in a very cotton candy world. We live in a cotton candy world. Man, people want instant satisfaction. They do not want to go 10 years. They do not want to go the distance, which is why so many people are just mediocre at what they do. They, you know, the average from 20 to 30 years old, you know how many times a 20 to 30 year old is changing jobs in today's society? 24 to 37 times. So you know what they do? They start something, they don't like their boss, they don't like the hours, they quit. They start something else, they don't like their job, they don't like their boss, they quit. They start something, they don't like their job, they don't. It's just a constant churn because we're, we're, we live in such an instant gratification society today. And I don't think that's where success is. The people that are great show up every day. Ronnie Martin is great because he's in there at 5.30 on Saturday mornings. You show me another banker that's in there on, at 5.30 on Saturday morning. I guarantee they ain't even thought about getting out of bed let alone in there working on deals. There's a, there's a drive and hunger inside of him that propels him to want to be great. I can't give that to you, okay? I, I, I can try to, in, you know, we talk about prey drive, which is an instinctual, a carnivore's instinctual desire to see something and go get it. I can't give it to you. you got, I can help you find it. I can challenge you. But, but you got to dig in and decide if you want this, how bad you want something. That's what I would tell you. Um, now let me say this, with my daughter, my daughter's got it. And whether she got it from me, she, my daughter is like a pit bull on a bone, man. When she finds something, she sinks into it. And, and I teach her, we don't whine, we don't complain, we don't make excuses. We don't whine, we don't complain, we don't make excuses. Fight through this, you know, you can fight through this. And that's what I was telling her that day, you can fight through this, you know. And, 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 I'm softer on her than Natalie is. Natalie's more disciplined on my daughter because I'm, you know, she's a girl and I'm her dad and she looks at me and kind of cries one time and I give in. But Natalie is tough on her and, and that's a good thing because she needs to have that discipline. She goes to gymnastics for nine and a half hours a week. She's five years old. And we talk about this a lot. Is that too much? And I told her this morning, I know you're not always going to feel like it, but this is going to teach you a very valuable lesson to show up when you don't feel like it, you know? She, she don't always understand, but I think we're implanting something in her that'll serve her, serve her good later. Quick question. When was the first time your company hit the million dollar threat? It wasn't very long ago. It hit a million dollars. We did a million dollars of revenue uh, probably three, maybe three years ago, three okay. to four years ago. I remember <clears throat> when you hit that number and in January, you, you uh, made the decision, well, next year we're going to do 2.4. <laughs> and you hold people and yourself to that unrealistic number. How do you convince yourself that I can do this? Because he really does this. He comes up with these crazy ass, we're going to do this. And he holds his people accountable and he, he drives them. Eric, are you still here? Where are you, buddy? You know how he is. He, he has unrealistic, crazy expectations. And when I'm throwing that kind of stuff out there, there's a part of me that just don't quite believe it. And I don't quite hold myself to those account, that, to the, those measurements. How do you do that? Where does that come from? Do you really believe it? I believe that you shoot for the moon, and if you come up short, you still accomplished a whole lot more than anybody else. So I, I do set my targets 100% growth. That means I want to go from 1.2 to 2.4. This year I set my targets at uh, 6.4 million in revenue. It's a crazy, ridiculous number. My big target's 10 point, you know, 10.4 million, and I write it down every day. We're doing 10.4 million of revenue. Now, I haven't figured out how to get us there yet, but, but let's say I go from this year, let's say we did almost $4 million of revenue. And let's say that I, sh I shoot for 6.4 and I come up at 5.8. What does it matter? Everybody with me? I'm, I think you should be growing 10, 20, 30% just by getting out of bed in the morning. If you're not growing 10 or 20 or 30%, something's wrong. 
We're spending more money in this society than we've ever spent. We got an economy that's booming. You know, people, people are paying the money. I mean, it's, in my opinion, you should set ridiculous targets. When I was at Riverdale, I got the job. I see Dave Thomas back there. He's a famous quarterback from Riverdale. You know how I got the job? I was 21 years old. I went in to interview with Tom Nolan, the principal. He took all the resumes of all the coaches who had interviewed, and he put them across the table and said, here's all the people who have interviewed for this job, and they won a lot of games. Now, you tell me why I should hire you. You're 22 years old. you got no proven track record. And I just looked at him and said, because I'm going to bring the one thing to this place that's never been done. I'm going to win a championship here. That's what you're going to hire me to do. And if I coach as long as they do, I'm going to have a better resume than them. And that answer, he looked at me and you know what he said? You got the job. He said, we're going to announce it next Thursday. All I was selling him was what? Confidence. I didn't know if I could win a championship or not. But I was going to die trying. I know that. And it took us 10 years to turn that place around. And hopefully they'll win the seventh championship this week. If everything goes right, they're playing tonight. Maybe they'll win number seven. But at that time, it had never been done before in 30-something years. So I was really just convincing myself that we were going to manifest something in the future that wasn't quite here yet. And I had to, I had to bet on me. So for you out there, you got to bet on you. Set crazy goals. I do push people hard. Some people can handle that and some people can't. I do have churn. I do have turnover. Um, some people quit. Some people say, I don't want to go on a journey with you. I don't want to go that hard. I'm only looking for a certain type of person. And that is a person who is deeply interested in their own personal potential. And that's what I tell people now when I interview them. If you're not interested in your own potential and you're not willing to push as hard as you can, then we don't need to work with each other because I'm going to try to extract. You know, I see what's going on with Eric White. Eric White came to us. He had never sold anything in his life. He had been a basketball coach his whole life. And um, I watch what's happened with him over the last, you know, six months or so. What's the biggest month you've had, E, so far? So, so, so in six months, he sold a hundred, in one month, he sold a hundred thousand dollars worth of coaching. And it's a person that's never sold in his whole life. That's impressive. You know why? He comes in every day, he shows up, he listens, he pays attention, he gets better. Every phone call, he gets better. Okay, and, and, but, but a lot of people would come in and go, man, I can't take it. The hours are too long. I start, it's too hard. But you've got to be interested in your own potential, man. And your employees got to be interested in their own potential, too. If they're not, it's never going to work. Right, Bill Taylor? You've been running business for 30 years. You know, you've been successful. And I guarantee you push your people because I can tell when I come over there, man. It, it, you know, you push them. And I, some of those people are going to go, I'm not interested in this. I want to take the easy way out. I guarantee working with you at your place, you're going to push people. So, you know, do you want to halfway go all the way or do you want to go all the way, right? That's what you've got to ask yourself. You're tough. I mean, you are a very tough, hard-nosed person. Do you feel like you show those people that support you enough? Do you, do you feel like you show them enough affection and appreciation or is that something you're weak at? I think I'm weak at that. I'm tough by nature. I'm very, I don't even show my wife enough love and appreciation. Um, she would tell you I'm, I'm too callous. I'm not, sen I'm not very sensitive. I, like I said, I grew up, and maybe this comes from my background, I don't remember my dad ever telling me he loved me. When they divorced, I, I, my dad never hugged me. He never told me he loved me. He was never involved in my life. I don't know if that's where my, that toughness comes out in me, but I'm very weak at telling people they do a good job. I'm very weak at, I'm, I'm not a good, patting people on the back and you, you know I'm kind of like a Nick Saban in some ways is, is I show up and I'm tough to work with but I think that's an area I can get better at in some ways I think in some ways I think that needs to be another person on my team that is coming in and being a cheerleader and keeping people pumped up and doing those things because I don't know personally if I'll ever be that good at that I just think it's not in my name it's, it's, I won't say it's an excuse but you know, I think if Ronnie Martin and I worked together, we wouldn't sit around and tell each other how great we were. We'd just get in there and get after it. And that's just who we are. So, so I don't think Saban tells everybody how great they are. I think show up and let's be great, and that's what they do. So that's, I'd say that's a weakness of mine. 
Okay, hey, these tough these questions are gonna keep getting tough. Oh, uh, so hey, uh, maybe I need a drink now. <laughs> hey, yeah. so uh, in the last month, how many days do you think you've been gone? How many days are you on the road? How many days are you not with the family? I mean, sometimes it's as much as two weeks. I know I was gone for seven, seven straight days to Vegas and Phoenix, and um, you know, some days I'm gone as many as 12, 13, 14 days in a month. Okay, how do you get the buy-in? How do you get the family to believe that, that you're trying to put them at number one when you show them how often you're gone? Does it make it tougher at home? I think my wife really understands one big thing. And if you're married, I hope you get this concept. My wife understands that I believe this is my mission in life. It's not my job. You see the difference? We fought about this early on. We, we butted heads on this. And then she finally said, look, I'm going to quit fighting with you about this because this is much bigger than just your work. This is, you feel like this is your mission that God's put you on. Yes, I do. And I can't do it without you. So will you support me and let's support each other on this mission? And she does. She never tells me to quit working. It's one thing I can say about my wife. She never tells me to slow down. She never tells me to chill out. She never tells me, you gone too much. She never tells me, you know, she'll tell me from time to time, you need to spend more time with your daughter. She'll tell me you need to relax some, but she never tells me, hey, don't do this because you're stealing away from us. She supports the mission. Now, as a result of that, her life is improved. The quality of her life is improved. She lives in nicer houses. We, live, we vacation in better places. She's, she's down in Seaside right now at our, our Florida house. Everything in her life, she would tell you, has increased. Her confidence has increased. Her life has increased. The quality of her life has increased. What we can afford financially has increased. So there's some perks to this, too, that, that she enjoys. But more than anything, we distribute the labor in our house. She's in charge of our home. Everything. She's in charge of our daughter. Everything. She's in charge of our real estate. Everything. She's in charge of, of all this. Everything. I'm in charge of running our coaching business. Does that make sense? So we have a clear distribution of labor, and my wife loves what she does every day, and I love what I do every day. And then we come together and do it together. So it's, it's really a, a beautiful thing, uh, that, that, that how she supports me. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't do it without her. It's the best decision I ever made. Hey, before I ask any more questions, is, are, is anybody going to ask the super coach question? Do we have anything? Mr. Taylor, I'm going to let you go ahead and throw one out there. I went through a very disappointing time at one period and I, people were letting me down, people were disappointing me and, and, I, and I come up with a little system on how to handle disappointment. And, it, and I, if, if something happens a lot in my life, I try to create a mechanism for when it happens again. And so I created these five steps when I, when I meet disappointment. You know, sometimes when people disappoint you, it says a lot more about them than it does about you. You understand what I'm saying? There could be something going on with them that they don't tell you. I always say, one of the steps, I don't remember all five steps today, but one was look at the person. Some people have a habit of disappointing other people. Wouldn't you agree? That's what they do every day is they disappoint people. You just happen to be one of them that they disappointed that day. Uh, one was uh, can constantly focus on the positive and try to remember all of this versus this, right? And then I always ask this question, what was my contribution to this? What was my contribution to this? Because many times we contribute to our own adversity by our decisions or lack of decisions that we make. So I, I, as a high school basketball coach, I used to hate when parents would come complain. I used to hate it. I used to insulate myself from parents. And then as I began to mature, sometimes those people had a good point. I didn't like the way they said it. I didn't like the way they delivered it to me. But when our customers tell us something, you know, I may not like the way they say it. I may think they're complaining or whining. But, but a lot of times, there's a seed of truth in what they're saying. You know, and, and so I just try to go through my little system anytime I reach some disappointment. The biggest thing we're fighting now is I started small. I could talk to Tommy every day. I could talk to Dave Steg every day. Now I'm servicing 1,000 people. And as I'm growing, people get their feelings hurt very easily if I don't talk to them, if I don't spend enough time with them, if I don't say hi to them. And what I would just ask for them is just a little bit of grace as we scale this business out. It's hard for me to talk to a thousand people in a day. 
So people will send me messages, and if I don't get back to them immediately, you know, did, I, did they get their feelings hurt very easily? And I'm like, man, it's not you. We just got a lot of stuff going on, and I'm trying to service everybody at the level I want to service it. And that's part of scaling and growing, especially if the business is dependent on one person like my business is. You know, we, we, we're trying to figure out how to do that, and, and that's a struggle some days. Eric White probably got 20 to 30 calls today that had nothing to do with selling. It was just, where am I supposed to go? What time am I supposed to be there? Can I get on Facebook? Can I talk to Coach Burt? You know, and so imagine if I was servicing 200,000 people. What kind of problems you have at that? So what I tell you, Bill, is as you, as you service the number of people you service in a day, there's going to be one person that's always unhappy with you. It don't matter how good you are, how good you do it. It don't matter, man. And, and what we got to condition ourselves to is constantly redirect. Stay in a state of gratitude. Stay in a state of, of look at all these positive people, man. Not that one negative comment. Focus on the positive. You know the most resistance I get, Phil Griffin, you know where the most resistance I get is in Murfreesboro. When I leave Murfreesboro, Paul Parkinson, how did those people treat me in Las Vegas? There was a thousand people in line to meet me in Las Vegas. A thousand. Just to take a picture with me. Just to, for me to sign their book. I mean, and then I come back home to Murfreesboro and I get treated rough in Murfreesboro, man. <laughs> I mean, I get treated rough. Self-promoter, picture on a bus, he's got his own airplane. You know, I mean, I get a lot of, I get more hate in Murfreesboro than anywhere. Because when I leave Murfreesboro, I'm an expert. When I'm in Murfreesboro, people are negative toward me. Like I said, I go to the grocery store and, you know, somebody called in the other day and was complaining because I have an airplane and I can't believe you got your own airplane and quit being so, you know. I said, look, I got a five-year-old daughter. I want to see my daughter, okay? When I go on the road, as much as I do, I want to go do my deal and I want to come home and see my five-year-old kid. That's why I have an airplane, okay? If you had a five-year-old kid and you was gone as much as me, you'd want an airplane too. And you know what they did? They shut up because they thought it was all just promotion. So here's what I would tell you. In my opinion, confidence is an internal knowing that you can create or manifest what you see in your mind, even when other people tell you that you can't. That's confidence. It's typically the memory of success. Arrogance is when your self-appraisal is greater than your market value. It is when you can't back up what you're saying and you act like you can. So you run around and you, you, you know, but, but to me, confident people recognize confidence in other people. Like all you guys are confident people. I don't see you as arrogant. I see you as confident. You know, I see because I recognize that in you. Arrogance, in my opinion, is where you can't back it up, man. You, you all talk and, and, and no, you know, was it all hat and no cattle or whatever in, in Texas? I mean, it's, you see what I'm saying? So, but, but when you get no successful, there's going to be a lot of people say you're arrogant. When I wrote a book with Rick Insell, the coach at MTSU, the number one thing people said to me is, I can't believe you would write a book with Rick Insell. He's so arrogant. Here's what I said. He's won. He was in 19 championship games as a high school coach. He's won almost as many games as John Wooden. He's one of the greatest high school and college coaches the game has ever seen. If you take away his confidence, you take away the one thing that makes him great. He's not arrogant. He's confident. Do you want your coach to be confident or not? But so many people would say he's arrogant. Well, the man's, he's, he's backed it up. So I see a lot of confident people in Rutherford County that are successful, but a lot of people think they're arrogant. I'd say they're not arrogant. They're, they're confident. They're confident. And that's the business. My real estate agent needs to be confident. I don't, I, you know what I'm saying? So all the promotion, listen, he gets a lot of haters. You know the number one question I get about him everywhere I go? What about this good time Tommy? What is this all this mess this good time Tommy does? I mean, I get it over and over and over because people know that I'm his coach. You know what I said? Tommy's team did over 100 deals last year. How many did you do? Well, I did seven. Okay then, shut up. <laughs> because let me tell you something. I've seen this guy go from doing 40 deals a year to 100 and what, 120? 105. 105. <laughs> hey, is, is he arrogant or is he confident? Listen, there'll be a lot of real estate agents that never reach 100 deals. So here's what I say. You may not like what Tommy's doing. You may not get what he's doing. It don't matter. He's doing it. Okay? So, so what was the old uh, 
the, the saying, that you, it's easy to criticize people who are in the arena, especially if you're outside the arena. You get in the arena, okay? You know, last week when I was speaking to 10,000 people, it's easy to sit out there in the stands and criticize me for what I said or how I say it. Or, but, but get up on that stage in front of 10,000 people and see how easy that is. It ain't easy. I mean, it's, 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 so I would just tell, if you're in the arena, say whatever you want to say. But if you're not, just, you know, I, I encourage you, don't say anything. We're, uh, we're kind of winding down here. I want to ask a few more questions. It's, I, th I think you have a hard time with trusting people from a relationship. Why is it so hard to get close to you? You know, like I said, I don't, if we, if we, if we brought a, a, a therapist in here, it would probably say daddy issues or, you know, like I said, maybe I, maybe I don't trust people like I should. I've been let down a lot in my life by people that I did trust. People that I thought I could count on that, like I said, were there one day, the next day they weren't. So I'm not very free with trusting people. I, I, here's one of my sayings, and maybe this is wrong. Never let another person stand between you and your destiny. When you take your destiny and you put it in another person's hands, in my opinion, that destiny is in jeopardy. Everybody, everybody follow me? They may or may not come through for you. So although I set sales goals and Eric is selling for us, I'm going to make sure we hit that number. And I don't care if I have a sales team of 100 people. In my opinion, I set the goal. It's my goal. I got to jump in and do whatever I got to do to make sure it, because I can't put my future in other people's hands. Does that make sense? Even if I trust them or not. And you say, well, that's going to cause a problem with scaling. It probably is. Uh, it causes a lot of problems for me because, I, you know, I watch everything that's going on. I keep my hands in everything. Maybe that's micromanagement, but, but I've just been let down a lot in my life. And, and I, I want to make sure we deliver the goods like we said we were going to. So I think that's part of the reason. I think I'm, I'm worried about people letting me down because I've seen it happen so many times. Why are you so bad on vacation? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you why I sucked on vacation at times. He's right. I was awful. If you went on vacation with me on no, this I've trip. No, I've been on trips with you before. Yeah. I've been on, but it's what comes, tell these people what comes first on your vacations because it ain't being present yeah. with the people that, when yeah. you're on vacation, you, it's like you never leave yeah. the greatness factory. So tell us, how would you rank your priorities when you're on vacation? Very seldom do I vacate. And what, see, I think there's two types of vacations. There is a vacation, and some people see vacation as an escape from their life. Like, I need to vacate. And there are times I want to do this. Then there are what's called recreations, in my opinion. When I go on vacation, my mind works. It, it opens my mind up. So my mind is thinking. And I'm very creative when I go to oceans, beaches. So, so I may, you know, I take, a, I take a suitcase for books when I go on vacation. I take almost 20 books on every vacation I go on. And my wife has learned that that's just who he is. You know, he's going to read books. He may write a book while we're on vacation. He may, for me, it's like when I vacate and I have a day off, then my mind just starts going. So I don't really vacate very much. Do I need to? Yes. Uh, so when I go on vacation, I'm not very much fun to go with because everybody's having fun and I'm, my mind is working and I'm working. Now, the last time we went on vacation, I was so bad. My company, we did not have the infrastructure in place to handle some of the things we were doing. So we were dealing with customer issues. Um, we had staff issues. And so every day I was supposed to be on vacation, I'm having to deal with clients because we, we were not satisfying what we were supposed to be doing. And so I'm on vacation, but I'm trying to save big accounts. I'm trying to make sure things are going like they're supposed to go. So I really just couldn't relax. So I was really miserable on, on this particular vacation we were on because I just didn't have a good sense of like peace. Like I, I didn't feel like my staff could handle what was going on. So I felt like, man, I, so I'm mad, I'm pissed off. I'm mad because I can't go on vacation, right? I'm mad because I don't have the infrastructure in place. That's my fault. I'm mad because I don't have enough people on my team. And I can't even vacation with my friends and my daughter. So, so there, I was just in a bad, I was in a funk. I was just in a bad funk. It was, not a good, it was not a good deal for me. 
Let me get to a couple more of these questions I've got. A lot of times you bring up ideas to me and you move extremely quick on an idea. Coach have an idea and he wants to immediately go to action. It doesn't matter how crazy that idea is. We want to go out and buy this $30 million building. That's, he wants to take immediate action. And I'm sitting there and I'm kind of, I got a little fear about me. I never really see you flinch with fear. Do you have fear? Do you fight through the fear? I want to know how, what your thoughts on that. I mean, these crazy things that you want to go out and do without consideration. Yeah. Fear is an unpleasant emotion created by a belief that something's going to hurt us in the future. Notice I said the word emotion. It's a feeling, right? I believe the way you fight through fear is by taking action. So I come up with an idea. I want to purchase something. It's $30 million. So what? We'll go get the money. Hey, we got Ronnie Martin on our team. What else do we need, right? Are you shaking back there, Ronnie? Are you Martin? scared, Ronnie? <laughs> but listen, Ronnie will tell me you don't need to do it. I'll try to convince Ronnie that we do need to do it. I'll meet his skepticism with my confidence. And I'll say, look, man, I'm telling you, I see something that other people don't see. Well, I, I was going to lead this into this. There's people here. How, is there anything that you can tell them for them to start singing their best versions of themselves? Is there something that my buddy Jimbo over here, is there something that you can tell our audience, and we'll end on this, is there something that you can tell them, hey, think like this? How do I think like this? The number one thing I would tell people is you got to get around people thinking bigger than you. This is the number one problem people have. When I get around a person running a $100 million company, like I'm going down to Florida in the morning, and I'm going to spend three days with a guy running a $100 to $150 million company. Look how much bigger that is in my company. And I'm going to ask questions and listen and learn. And he's going to tell me what I need to do. He's going to say, look, Coach Burt, for you to go to, from $4 million to $6 million to $10 million to $100 million, here's what you got to do. Now, nine out of ten people will argue with him. They'll say, no, I don't even do it this way, blah, blah, blah. When people tell me to do something, I do it. When I listen to Grant Cardone and he says, look, Bert, you got to do this and this and this, I don't argue with him because he's worth, you know, half, you know, whatever, half a million dollars, whatever it is. He knows something I don't know. Here's the problem. If a person has figured out how to make one more dollar than you, do they know something you don't know? Yes or no? When they tell you how to make more dollars, you don't need to sit there and argue with them. You need to go... Yes, sir. So I see it all the time. I tell people all the time, you need to do this, you need to do this, and you need to do this. And they sit there and argue with me. And I'll be like, well, if, if, I, if I'm earning this much money and you're earning this much money, I figured out something you don't know, right? And you said this to me one day. I asked Tommy for advice, and he said something back to me. He said, do you earn a lot more money than me? And I said, maybe. And he said, well, then why are you asking me? You don't need to be asking me. You need to be asking somebody up here. And so if you, if you were asking me, how, do you, how does Jim, Jimbo, I'm one of your clients, right? You're getting money out of my pocket right now, but you could get more. And here's, here's what I would tell you. When you get around bigger thinkers, we have people in my coaching program earning almost $5 million a year, personal income. Okay? They're in there. All you got to do is spend time around them. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to make you think bigger. They're going to make you get out of this little bitty bubble. And they're going to help you see things. But it, what if you never get around those people? What if you always hang around the same type people? I got buddies from Woodbury, Tennessee, where I grew up, still trying to get me to move back to Woodbury. You know what I said? It ain't happening. Because everybody in Woodbury is thinking like this. I want to think like this. So I got to go wherever I have to go to think like this. And I got to get around people who are thinking like that. That's how you think bigger, is you get around people operating on a much higher level. I can definitely agree with that because the, the best decision I made was becoming your best buddy and, and getting in your programs. Yeah. But the other thing is I've kind of recycled who I'm hanging out with, who's influencing me. I think, I mean, there's still parts of me that goes back to that very tiny thinking and I hate that, but the way I've improved my, my income, what I know, my knowledge, my skill, is I've surrounded myself the best way I could with higher, 
higher level people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why we're doing level up. Does anybody have any questions? Do you want to ask this super coach anything? How hard it would be to start a small business and grow it? How much money you really need? How much money you got to make to actually keep any money? See, nobody told me how much money you really have to make to keep any money. You see what I'm saying? Like, like I started this business in 08, right in the middle of the recession. The first people I picked up was John Floyd at Old South. Thank, thank the good Lord that he hired me. I picked up First Bank. I picked up some big people within the first year. And thank goodness, because that sustained me for the first year. I didn't understand how much money we really have. People don't understand how much this cost to, for me to build this out, how much money this costs, for me to build a new $2 million greatness factory, for me to, for us to be able to take a, a, a plane tomorrow down to, you know, it cost me six or $7,000 to fly down to Florida tomorrow with these clients on this plane. It, it, that ain't Southwest, that ain't 179 bucks. You know, that's six or $7,000 to fly an hour. Now, here's what I would tell you. I didn't know that. I was like, man, good Lord, it costs so much money to, to, to keep any money in a small business. And we get crushed with taxes. We're not really incentivized to want to grow, you know. So, so I would tell all the small business owners that that's the biggest thing that I didn't know when I started this. I just wanted to coach people, you know. I, that's that's really my heart is I just wanted to coach people, and I just didn't know how how brutal business would be to go out there and to go out there and make it work. It's a great question. I want to piggyback on that. Do you need to keep those people? Well, there's a term called creative destruction, and Creative destruction is where somebody is out there looking at your business model and they're studying it and they're trying to do it better, faster, cheaper than you. And if you don't creatively destroy your own business model consistently, somebody else will. You understand what I'm telling you? Now, here's what I would tell you. The people who are closest to me that have been right there with me, the Ronnie Martins, the Tommy Davidsons, Eric White, who's been with me for years and years as a friend, they're still right there with me. It don't matter how big we get. It don't matter how far we go. They're going to be right there with me. You see what I'm saying? I stayed in the same suite with Tommy and Brittany when we were in Vegas. You know, I, I don't, I'm not ever going to lose that. Now, is it hard to keep personal relationships when you got a thousand people to tend to? Yes. But here's what I would tell you. I give my attention to people who give attention to me. There's nothing stopping you. I've seen Clint get more involved with my programs. He gets attention from me. You know why? He shows up every month. You don't get any attention from me when you're out there in La La Land. You never show up. You never engage with anything. You don't come to my private parties. Dave and Ginger's working out with me at 5 o'clock in the morning. So we're in there together. So I would tell you, I'm going to always be there for people that are right there for me at the end of the day. And if they stick with me, man, I'm going to stick with them. But here's the deal. Along with that comes my referrals, comes my partnership, comes my promotion of their businesses. I mean, I'm going to push the people that are closest to me and stay in the boat with me all the time. There's going to be people try to get my business. There's been 100 bankers in town try to get my business. But my relationship with Ronnie's too strong. They're not going to get it, right? These people have insulated themselves with me so that I don't open the door for other people to come in there and get that. So that's what I would tell you. That's a great question. All right, any other questions before we shut down and let the super coach? You going to Florida tomorrow? Going to Florida tomorrow. We didn't get invited, or did we get invited? You, you, you did, you just didn't want to pay to go down there. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just didn't pony up. Hey, I want to thank You can still go, by the way, if you want to go. <laughs> I do want to thank everybody for coming out here. This means yeah. a lot to me. Uh, the purpose is I want to help grow my brand. I want to leverage my relationships with people like Coach Bird, and there's going to be other people in the future. I want you back. I'll be in contact with you. But this was our very first edition of Level Up, and there's not a better person that I could think of that means more to me than this guy right here on today's show. So let's give the super coach. Hey, before that, hey, is there how many people here are not in Monster Producer? Now, look, hey, it's a very affordable thing you can get on the the – the Greatness Academy, what is, or what is it? Uh, what can these people get on if they're... Well, here's what I would tell you. We, we, we would never try to hard sell you on what we're doing. He will, but I won't. Um, I would just tell you, come and, come and experience it. C come and sit in on it. Come and sit in on the net. We got 500 and almost 585 people in this program now. These are all like-minded, hungry people 
who come on a monthly basis and get coached. Most of them are getting upward of a 40% increase in their business, which is my goal for every person I coach. So I would tell you if you're interested in that, you just ought to come one time, sit in on a course, come with him, he'll be, you know. And, and let me say this before we leave, there's, there's no one person out of everybody I've ever worked with that has shown a bigger transformation in their life than this guy. Okay. I mean that. I remember when I first started working and coaching Tommy Davidson, he would show up at my house on a Saturday with two extra large pizzas and two cases of beer <laughs> and eat all of it and drink all of it. And I used to coach his team and he would just sit there and look at me like this. I was coaching John Jones' team. John Jones was one of the first people to hire me. And I, was, I would leave there and I'd go, man, this guy, what in the hell is going on with him? I used to think that about him. I'm like, man, he's not getting it. He never took a note. He never did anything. But he was internalizing this. He was taking it in. And what I've watched happen in his life over the last four or five years has been remarkable. I mean, he has, he has become one of the top real estate people in the world. He's one of the best negotiators. I would trust any deal I've ever had with him. I don't care how big it is. I don't care if it's $25 million, $1 million, because he is really a true expert. And for all the hype, all the stuff you see with GTT, here's what I tell him a lot, man. People are not seeing how much you really got under the hood because you, you got a lot of stuff in here that's really, really powerful. So, you know, I know you do a lot of promotion, and that's all good. But underneath all that promotion is a true professional. And they're, they're, I'd love to say everybody in real estate's that way, but they're not. We all know that. So he's, he is the best testimony for our coaching program than we've ever had of anything that we've ever done. Enough of me. The first Friday of every month, he has Monster Producer right here. There's, uh, I think, three times. Is it three? Thursday night, Friday morning, twice. Three sermons. That's what I tell people. Three sermons. So the church is growing. And I, I can't, I don't know. Jonathan Sauls, you're uh, a client of mine, and I think there's few clients that I've had more transactions with other than like multiple channel accounts. Mm -hmm. You've probably seen a transformation in me where I'm completely different, and it all changed when I got into his coaching program. So I'm, I will hard sell you because it's transformed my life. It's kind of like somebody that's been through some crazy transformation, and that's how important it is to me because I've done it. But uh, get with me, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that. But I do want to thank everybody for coming out here, and the people that are listening, I appreciate it. Please like the podcast, please rate the podcast, mm -hmm. all, those other th all that other stuff I'm supposed to say, Kathleen. So <laughs> I want to grow this podcast, and I can't do it without, without your help. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. God bless you. Thank you.